This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast here on YouTube. If you can, go down below and hit that subscribe button. Tonight, our special guest is Tracy Lynn Martin. If you don't know who Tracy Lynn Martin is, you're really messing up because she is the person who set out to circumnavigate all of the Great Lakes. Yes, all of them. And her paddling skills are insane. She holds multiple world records, and I was super excited to do this podcast. So before I ramble on forever, let's dive right into it. All right, Tracy, thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great, and thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm pretty excited. Um, I was actually thinking about this earlier. So back in 2017, I was working at a park district, and... My friends, all these like nature nerdy kind of people were all sitting out at the parks and they're like, this lady, she's, she's paddling all the great lakes. And you're kind of like a local legend from here in Toledo, Ohio, where I'm, we're like right on Lake Erie. And then I started the podcast and I was like, Oh my gosh, I want to see if she'll come on the podcast. So I'm like super stoked right now. (laughs) Um, so, so thank you for coming on. And I want to, um, I want to, before we dive into the story of all this, because I know you've talked about it a ton, it was a little while ago and you've had a more recent attempt. I just wanted uh-huh. to kind of get a little background from you of how did you get into long distance kayaking? Because that's not like a thing that most people <laughs> get into. Um, well, I just love being out on the water. It's sort of my safe place when I'm feeling bad or having a bad day or, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with just all of the stuff that life can throw at you. Um, and I just loved to canoe and kayak. I've done it most of my life. There was a local uh, group um, nearby that was doing interval training and training for races. And I just sort of happened upon the group and started training with them more for fitness. I was planning on really doing the races. Um, but they sort of convinced me to sign up for a race. And the very first race I signed up for, I won uh, women's solo. So I sort of caught the bug and then I was signing up for all sorts of races. That, <laughs> did you grow up outdoors as a kid? Um, I have always preferred the outdoors as a kid. My family um, is not an outdoors family. To them, camping is like a Motel 8. Uh, <laughs> yep. So our Motel 6. So, yeah, so they're, um, they always said that maybe I'd been switched at the hospital with someone else (laughs) because I'm the only one that likes it. But, you know, when I was a kid, we had some um, train tracks by the house with some woods and I would walk up to the train tracks and walk on the train tracks out to the woods and play in the woods. I don't know. I just, um, I just prefer being outside. It's just, comforting yeah i feel the same way i mean my dad was somewhat of an outdoorsman but my mom and the rest of my family they're the same way my grandpa always says my idea of camping is like staying at the ritz carlton so (laughs) i totally get that um so i mean your record is is very impressive i think you said you hold like what like three different titles as like a long distance kayaking or a long distance kayaking in the great lakes i mean you're like basically one of the only people to do it and complete at least three of the Great Lakes. So how did you get this idea? Because I love the Great Lakes. I've been to Uh all of them except for Lake Ontario. And I just, they're so amazing. And and where I live, we're on the lake. So it's like a huge resource. Mm -hmm. It's like the big outdoors thing. So where did this kind of idea from or come from? Well, I used to have a racing partner. His name was Joe Zellner um, out of Grand Marais, um, Minnesota. And we did some races together and we trained together. And it was actually, he had suggested that no one had ever done, successfully done all five of the Great Lakes before. Um, and he sort of, you know, threw that out there at me. So I did some research and I realized that he was right. And, um, you know, I love the Great Lakes. I used to love going up and paddling on Superior. It was really the only Great Lake that I paddled on consistently. I had a friend out of Toffee, Minnesota, and I'd go up and, and paddle when he wasn't available. And um, and then I'd go up and paddle with Joe to train for races. So um, I just, you know, when my mother passed away, I just needed, um, I just, I just needed something 
different in my life. And I just decided, you know, everyone says one day they're going to do this. One day they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, one day they'll paddle the Great Lakes. One day they'll go to Europe. One day they'll they'll do whatever it is they want to do. Climb Mount Everest. And I'm like, what if one day never comes? You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, and I just decided to um, make the commitment, make the financial commitment to, um, to just do it. And um, it was the best decision of my life. It was just um, the memories that I have, the people that I met, just um, I'll cherish those for the rest of my life. As someone like I, I've, I've through hiked the Appalachian Trail and that's all, I mean, what you've done is way longer and arguably way more difficult because the water is no joke. Um, I've done like a 137 mile kayaking trip over like four days. That was extremely tough. So I can't imagine putting in 10 to 12 hours a day in a kayak. I mean, hiking is hard enough. And, yeah. but, but paddling that is, is brutality as like at its finest. So what was the training journey like for you on that? I'm, I'm just curious to know. Well, um, I was a competitive ultra endurance kayaker. So basically, um, I wasn't doing anything different. Um, just going out in my boat and doing interval training, doing some long distance paddling, uh, li- uh, weight, um, lifting weights. And basically my attitude was that, um, once I get out there and I'm paddling every single day, that's pretty good training in and of itself. So, yeah. um, I didn't do anything different than what I normally did, just um, training for my kayak races. I just, um, it was more mental. It was a mental of getting up every single day and going out there and just making yourself do it. Yeah. And I mean, planning something like this, when I did the Appalachian Trail, it was like six months, basically, Mm -hmm. you had to prepare for. What was your planning journey like? Uh, along that path because I know it's that's difficult because there's a whole new element of danger with when you get water involved in the Great Lakes are, are notorious for like really being dangerous sometimes so what did that look like for you? Well, it took two years to plan it out. And um, I had bounced some ideas off of Joe Zellner. Um, Joe's idea was that you would just do it self-supported. And um But after calculating it out, I was like, you know, I don't think that's realistic to do it self-supported. You really need a support vehicle to follow you because, I mean, if if you're like really, really cold or, you know, exhausted or if there's some really bad storms, it would be really good to have that support vehicle there. And just the safety factor of having someone right there, boots on the ground, keeping more or less an eye on you um, in case there was some trouble. So um, um, I I tried to um, reach out to different people. I ended up finding a support driver. He was absolutely fantastic. His name was uh, Bill Noble. He was retired um, from the kayaking group here in Kansas City. And he had done his own expedition when he was 30. He did the fur traders route and paddled from Montreal all the way up to the Arctic Circle. It took him two years. And during the winter, instead of coming back home to Kansas City, he he wintered up there. I believe he wintered up in um, Ely, Minnesota. So um, so he had the, uh, the background to be able to help me. And um, between the two of us, we made a really great um, um, partnership. That is awesome story. Uh, mm-hmm. That's I've noticed that like kayakers are either ultra hardcore or they just like paddle at the park on the weekend. There just really doesn't seem to be an in-between. And um, that's really awesome. I do. How, how detailed did you get with your planning? Because like, there's a lot of stuff. If you do stuff like this for a while, there's kind of things where you're just kind of like, yeah, I don't really need to plan this out too much. But I mean, from like a safety perspective, how much, how much of that did you really have to put in like big time and big hours to, to, to plan Um, out? There there was a lot of planning that I did before I started. And what I realized was that most of those plans went right out the window because, um, you know, you're on the lake and, you know, if there's a big storm, you can't go out. If, um, there's ice, you can't go out. Um, and if you get sick or injured, you need to rest for a day. So I had, um, places I had contacted different marinas and I'm like, Hey, we'll probably be pulling off and camping here overnight with the truck and trailer. Is that okay with you? Or, uh, there was different places where, 
um, Bill went and stayed at a campsite and I um, paddled and remote camped in a tent. Um, and most of those plans just went right out the window. And basically it was just a matter of getting up every day and putting in as many miles as I could and um, just not worrying about it. And a lot of the area that I went into was just totally unknown. And because you're, you're talking about 10,000 miles of shoreline. There's no way that you can map all of that out. And in the beginning, during the two years, I was trying to map out places where I could resupply, places where we could camp at. And what I realized worked better once we started was just to be flexible. And so Bill and I would get up in the morning, we'd look at the maps and we'd look at the charts and I'd be like, well, I think I can do 30 miles. I think I can get here. Why don't you get here? If I can go further, I'll camp. And if I can't get that far, you know, there's a boat ramp here. I can pull that out. And we were just very flexible. So, yeah, that's one thing that is really awesome about like what you've done is the sheer mileage I did when I did this, just the local river here, the Maumee River. I mean, mm-hmm. we, some days we put in like 40 miles, some days we put in like 30. I think the lowest day we did was like 25. And I mean, mm-hmm. that's on a moving river. So on a lake, that's like a whole new ball game. So how how tough was the the lake aspect of it versus just like paddling on your average, nice, easy flowing river? Uh, it was a huge wake up call. Most of my racing and paddling had been rivers, um, the Kansas River, the Missouri River. Um, the Colorado River. So um, I had done some paddling on a lake. Um, There was a race called the Two Damn Days on the Lake of the Ozarks. It's a 90-mile race. You do 50 miles the first day and 40 the second day. And I had taken first place in that in women's solo. So in my head, I was thinking, yeah, I can paddle 50 miles on a lake. (laughs) And um, the Lake of the Ozarks is not the Great Lakes. And I never paddled 50 miles. The most I paddled, I had one day that I paddled 49 miles. And that was like a 15-hour day. Wow. Um, Yeah. On average, I was paddling probably uh, 30, between 28 and 35 miles a day on average. And what I noticed was um, I could push myself really hard and get in like a 40-mile day or a 45-mile day. But then the next day, I was worthless. And so what I learned was, um, you know, it was better to do about 30 or 30 miles, 35 miles and stop than to push myself. And then the next day would be a crappy day. Yeah, that's that's the real kind of like deal breaker between long distance and just kind of like you know, racing, even if it's a long race, I've noticed Um, because I've done backpacking trips recently that have been, you know, a 25 mile loop and you can put in some bigger miles because you know, you're only gonna be out there for three days. But when you're out there for a year or six months, (laughs) it completely changes it. You're like, if I do 30 miles today, I'm going to be useless tomorrow. And especially the great lakes are just so unpredictable especially out here on lake erie that's like what it's known for being is like completely unpredictable um so that that was kind of like a a question i really had for you i know i've watched some of your youtube videos and i've watched some of the interviews you've been on and i was just like you said a few times there were like four or five times in your life where there's been some serious safety concerns while you're out on the lakes um what was your safety plan looking like and maybe even tell some of the stories of of what this the what, what happened out there that was like life threatening um there was probably four areas four times that was i was in serious jeopardy um and you know some of them was my stupidity and my fault for trying to push the envelope and uh like when i was trying to paddle around tobermory there was a storm moving in from the east and i and i knew that on the canadian side on lake huron if I could get around the Tobermory point, then I was protected. And the, and that storm system was just going to be going over my head. It was going to be a two-week storm system. It was in um, October, end of September, beginning of October. It was, this wind, like 30-mile-per-hour winds, was going to last, uh, according to my app that I had, it was going to last for about two weeks. So I, I really pushed the envelope trying to get to Tobermory and get around the point. And basically I found myself paddling in the dark uh, and the storm hit me. And uh, the cliffs around Tobermory, there was no place to land. Like, you know, it would be like 
an hour before sunset and I saw a beach and I thought I should land here. And then I thought, no, I'll land at the next beach. I've still got a little bit of daylight left. And then I would paddle and there was like, you know, 15 minutes before the sun was going to set and I saw a beach and I'm like, okay, do I land here or do I try, do I land at the next beach? And so I just kept pushing the envelope and then the storm hit, the lightning hit, the sun set and there was no more beaches. It was just cliffs. And that, so yeah. I was in big trouble. Um, luckily, I um, had my radio contact with Bill and my phone. And I told Bill, I said, I, I've got to find a place to land. So he found a park and was shining a spotlight out over the lake. But I was out there in that storm for about three hours before I found Bill, trying to get that, down the shoreline. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was. Um, it really caused me to reevaluate how important Palloon the Great Lakes was because I, I really thought I was going to die. And um, I was absolutely terrified for those three hours. And, um, but that was my own stupidity. There was another time on Lake Superior prior to this, um, it was raining and thundering and lightning. The storms just hit so fast. So I pulled off and, um, it was like a community of like about four or five houses in this bay. And there was a light on in one of the houses. So I walked, you know, it's thundering, it's lightning, it's black. It's like, I don't know, it's like three or four in the afternoon, but it's it's dark out. And I went and knocked on the person's door and I said, can I, um, he had a porch, a covered porch. I said, can I stay here on your covered porch until the storm passed? Because according to my phone, the storm was going to pass, according to the app that I had. And... Um, he basically told me he was going to call the police if I didn't get off of his property. This was private property. Um, it was, I think it was called the Huron Country Club or something. Um, but it was on Lake Superior on the South Shoreline by Big Bay. And this guy basically said if I didn't leave, he was going to call the police. So I made the decision to go ahead and get back in my boat and push out because the thing with the, with the record was if the police had come and made me move my boat, um, then, you know, I have to put back in where I take out at. And if they made me move my boat out of that community and took me down the shoreline, then everything I'd done up to that point was, was over. So I made the decision to get back in my boat and try to paddle out of that bay and around the next point into the next bay and um, it was some really treacherous water with lightning over my head. And um, I, I tried to stay closer to the cliffs than what I normally would because the rebound was terrible. But there was like really um, lightning cracking right over my head. And I thought, OK, I need to be closer to the cliffs because the lightning will strike the cliffs and not me. <laughs> but um, Yeah, but, you know, that didn't bother me. Because I made the conscious decision to go back out. I made the conscious decision to try to get around the point. And um, I, was, I was only out there for maybe an hour. Um, Tobermory really bothered me because I was out there for three hours. And, um, you know, even though on Lake Superior it was dark, it was still daylight. Tobermory, it was, it was night. And I couldn't see. I couldn't see the waves hitting me. I couldn't see the rebound. Every now and then the lightning would strike and I could sort of see um, the landscape. But yeah, that was that was a real game changer. I started paddling less and started um, really reevaluating how badly I wanted to do this. And I was tired by then. It was October. I was getting tired. Yeah. I can imagine, I mean, cold weather paddling is not something I've done yet. And it just sounds mm -hmm. like, I mean, when I did this in May and it was a little chilly, but it wasn't cold, it was still tolerable and we were still wearing wetsuits and stuff. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you have a, you have a sport team, you have, you know, a, a few people helping you out with this, but I mean, I know this is a really long endeavor. So you're talking multiple types of gear, multiple types of thing. But one thing that really interested me in looking in this, you kept talking about was it's called a surf ski versus a kayak. I've never heard of that. What is a surf ski? A surf ski? Um, it's basically an open type of kayak that's designed for racing. It's specifically designed for racing. The, um, the lifeguards out in Australia, uh, the design was first created to try to help them get out to people that were drowning faster. And basically it's just an, a, it's a very light open boat. You pick it up, you run out, you jump in it. 
um, and it self bells. So it's um, if if the waves splash inside of you, because because there's no you don't slide inside of you're sitting right on top. So if the waves fill it up, as long as you're paddling, it self bells. And for me with my rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it was very easy for me to get in and out of that boat. One, it's a faster boat than a, than a sea kayak, in my opinion. A surf mm-hmm. skis are designed uh, to be fast. They're designed to be paddled on ocean waves. Um, and so I just felt like the design was better um, for me personally getting in and out of it. Um, Because, you know, a lot of the times I would pull off, I'd be in remote areas, I'm out there by myself. And if there's big waves, and I'm having to push off in big waves, I don't know if I could have done that in a sea kayak with the rheumatoid arthritis and my knees, you know, trying to get into the boat and bend my knees and then uh, all of that. Um, I'm not sure if I could have done it, but with the surf ski, you know, I wore my dry suit out of the 10 months. I wore my dry suit probably nine months in three weeks. So I was always wearing my dry suit. So I would just push the boat out, jump in, start paddling, you know, the waves would crash over me and it would self bound. It was no big deal getting out. Yeah. That's, that's actually sounds pretty awesome because I've, I've been in the sea kayaks a few times and like, frankly, mm-hmm. they're paying the ass to get in and out of, you know, <laughs> like they are, especially if you, if you have to get off like on a high dock or something on, on a, on a landing mm-hmm. or something, and there's no just like easy pull off. It's really is like balance and difficult. And then they're really hard to get back in if you fall out. Um, so other than that, what does your gear look like? Cause I know a lot of people are just like, overly obsessed with gear and i there's like a basic thing you need to to do any long distance paddle but what was your kind of day-to-day gear setup looking like i mean we're talking you have to be prepared to camp you have to be prepared to cook you have to have food you have to have clothing what did all that look like for you so um i actually did it ultralight back when i was younger i did a bunch of ultralight backpacking so i sort of incorporated that because a surf ski is um a very thin narrow long boat my boat was 20 feet long and 18 inches wide so it's it's not um you know you don't have you i put a hatch in it um but it you know, you're not, you don't have the carrying capacity of a sea kayak. So everything that I took, I made sure I had more than one purpose for it. And if I couldn't figure out more than one purpose for it, I didn't take it. Um, I had my, um, I, I always had my dry suit and then I had a layer of clothes on or two layers of clothes on under the dry suit. In the hatch, I always had a tent and, um, a sleeping pad and my sleeping bag. Um, for food, I would have like protein bars, um, I never carried a stove. I because you know one you've got the stove, then you got the fuel for the stove. So sometimes at night I would make a fire, um, but I never cooked any food. Even when even like when I did areas like Pakasa where I was out there for you know eight days by myself, uh, remote camping. Um, I always took food that I could eat cold. I would filter my water right out of the lake. I didn't carry water with me. I'd filter it out of the lake. Uh, I'd have instant coffee that I'd pour into my bottled water and I drank that cold. Um, sometimes I'd have the little packets of the Kool-Aid and, um, so I made sure. And then like my life jacket, I also used as a pillow, um, And so I was really able to evaluate every single piece of equipment that I had. I did have uh, safety equipment that I carried um, within my, within reach um, on the back hatch. And that included flares. Um, I had my spot global tracker. I had um, my Marine radio. Uh, And with the radio, I could contact my support crew if they weren't too far away and, but I also got the, the weather stations too. So I could always keep track of what was going on with the weather stations. Um, I had, um, solar panels so I could keep my phone charged. I carried two cell phones with me and the cell phones had apps on them to help with navigation. And then I also had my Marine radio, um, and, um, then I had a Garmin GPS too. So, um, I just made sure, so, you know, there was no fancy cooking equipment, there was no stoves, there was no cookware, um, there was no fuel that I had to take, and that saved a lot of space. Um, I had one extra pair of clothing that I had, I had two um, extra pairs of wool socks, I had um, a hat, and um, I had my paddling gloves, and then I had another pair of just wool gloves that I would wear around camp. Um, 
And then I had my camp shoes and I had them on the bungees, under the bungees on my boat. So um, I just really utilized every single amount of space that I had. And yeah. it, it, and I didn't take anything extra. So yeah, a lot of people um, was concerned because I didn't have a lot of extra stuff. But, um, you know, I felt like if there was an emergency, I had my spot global tracker that I could have hit for an SOS. Um, and um, I just I felt safe out there. So. And that's that's really important. I mean, uh, a lot of people who are more experienced with backpacking or whatever, you know, I've, I've found personally that all my lightweight backpacking gear translated to kayaking super easily. Like I didn't need to buy anything except for a dry suit, really, and the kayak itself. Other than that, a tent's a tent, a lightweight tent's a tent, a dry bag's a dry bag. Like it's not really that complicated. Um, and I, I feel like people just get so obsessed with gear when it, when in reality you really don't need that much. You need a few things here okay. and there, and you just kind of to kind of go for it. Um, right. The the one thing that really interests me living up here in Ohio on the Great Lakes is, I mean, you have to have a few favorite spots across the board because a lot of coastline is just coastline, but there's some spots in Michigan, especially that are just mind blowing. I feel uh-huh. like I already know what you're going to say, but <laughs> did you have any really favorite spots that really stuck out to you? Uh, definitely Sleeping Bear um, was probably my most favorite spot on Lake Michigan. Um, the Apostle Islands and Pakasa would have been my favorite spots on uh, Lake Superior. So on Lake Superior, you have the South Shore Line, and the two really amazing places there was Pitchard Rocks and the Apostle Islands. Um, and then on the North Shore Line, you have Pakasa, you have the Canadian Wilderness. Um, so on, on the North Shore, I would paddle like, you know, four, five, six days without seeing Bill. And then... Um, and then I'd find Bill and I'd resupply and then I'd just go in right back out and paddle another five, six, seven days by myself. Uh, and those memories are just um, fantastic. I really have treasured those memories. Just, you know, you've got a lot of the cliffs. You have, um, you know, the little rock islands. I would uh, camp on the rock islands. I always preferred trying to find a small rock island to camp on as, op- as opposed to the mainland just to keep myself safe from the bears because there's a lot of bears mm-hmm. up there. Um, but, um, you know, getting out of your tent like around midnight and looking at the stars and, and the stars shimmering off the lake. It's just, it's just magical. You can't, um, I don't know. There's no other way to describe it. And so yeah. those memories I will have for the rest of my life. And that's, that's what I, you know, you try and tell like the average person that you run into is never going to do any sort of long distance trip. So they're always asking questions. And it's like, for me, the things that stand out, I don't remember a lot of the grueling days. I don't remember the big miles. I don't remember being sore, but I remember the beautiful stuff. I remember the amazing moments where you're hundreds of miles from another human and you're just like, this is great. You you know, you remember being scared sometimes, but then you look back on it and you're like, yeah, I survived that. I'm (laughs) awesome. You know, but like, that's, that's really awesome. And, and I, the, I mean, just, I haven't been to the Canadian side of the Great Lakes. I really want to go. I think the only Great Lake I haven't been to is Ontario. So, you know, it's like that's one thing I need to check out. And part of my podcast is based out of the Midwest. So, like, I'm always trying to get people to realize how beautiful it is up here because they just think cornfields and, you know, not much going on. And it's it's just amazing that you've done everything that you've done. But one of the things that I really, really like is that you're willing to overcome your pain and, and, and your, your health issues that you have. So what advice do you give to everyone? Because like even a lot of able-bodied people that don't have any health issues, aren't going to do anything and they don't really take care of themselves. So when you have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and it, you know, it's probably excruciating half the time and you're doing more miles than anyone I've ever met to date. What, (laughs) what advice do you have for people? Well, my rheumatoid arthritis is mostly in my feet, ankles and knees. 
Um, if I get a flare, you know, my wrist and hands will hurt too. But so my upper body is pretty much intact. So that's how I can keep paddling like I have been. Um, but what I tell people is to never give up on what you love to do and just to adapt. You know, like when my wrist is hurting really bad, I might um, get like a wrist brace and I have to adapt how I hold the paddle. I have to adapt how, you know, how I move in, in, the, in the boat. But if you can figure it out and adapt and do the things that you love, you're going to be happier. And, you know, life is short and life is precious. And if you're in chronic pain, you know, that sucks, but you can be in chronic pain and sit in your house and feel sorry for yourself. Or you can be in chronic pain and go out and still do the stuff that you love. You know, I realize not everyone's going to love to kayak for days on end, but you know what, if you just love to go out and golf, if you just love to, take a walk in the park if what you love to do is to just play tennis but you're in chronic pain figure out a way to hold the tennis racket maybe differently maybe it's not as efficient you know I get that a lot from um, racers they'll be like you know you're not holding that paddle very efficiently or you're not hitting the water efficiently and I'm like well I know but the way my joints are this is how I have to do it and I do very fairly well so you know I can't change. So don't be afraid to go against what other people are telling you. If someone is saying, oh, you've got, you know, you're, you know, you've lost a leg, you can't go do, you can't go hike. So yes, I can. I just have to figure it out. I just have to adapt. I just have to figure it out. And, you know, that's what life is about is adapting and figuring out and still doing what you love, because I can't imagine anything more miserable than not doing what you love. I 100% feel that. I mean, that's that's why like us crazy outdoors people do this <laughs> stuff because it's it's it, it, we know it's going to suck and we know it's going to be miserable sometimes, but like it you just I don't have a choice when I decide to do something like this. My brain just is like, "Sorry, dude, you're in it now." Like, you don't <laughs> I don't choose this. It just happens. Um so yeah, it's I totally can relate to that. And like Long distance is a whole different ball game. It's just, it's not the same. Uh, and you're, you put, I mean, what was the, the 2017 trip was like 3,400 miles or something, correct? Oh, my trip, uh, 3,592 miles. That's, and I, yeah. I, on my spot tracker, I had an independent third company monitoring the miles on my spot tracker. So they were able to um, um, keep very detailed records. So that's what they, that was their final total that I paddled was 3,592 miles. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that is a yeah. ton of miles. And that's super amazing. Um, so see, there's, there well, has it to been be. Better if it it would have been easier had it been river miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, river miles, 3,000 miles is one thing. Lake miles, I've paddled a ton of lakes and it's just like. Yeah. No, it's it's like just fighting you the whole time. There's you don't just glide for fun. It just stops when you stop paddling. So yeah. that's that's super insane. But you have to have pushing you backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. But you have to have some favorite moments along a trick that are along a trip that long. So is there anything that really stood out for you, like it, any throughout the whole trip? Um, just the really amazing people that I met. Um, you know, I would pull into a place. So my spot tracker was on uh, social media. So anyone, and it was on race hour, which was that independent third company. Mm -hmm. So anyone could pull up race hour, or pull up my Facebook page or my social media and see exactly where I was at. And sometimes I would pull off the water and I'd be setting up my camp and people would just show up and they'd be like, are you that Tracy Martin? And they'd like, you know, they'd say, are you cold? You know, we brought you some hot food. We brought you some hot coffee, some hot chocolate. And that that really touched my heart, just the fact that people cared. Um, when I had to walk my boat around Niagara Falls, um, there was a, a because that was really hard for me. It involved walking and um, walking is really hard for me now. It was a 13 mile walk and I was pulling my that, boat. Yeah. No one could help me. So I was, you know, walking and pulling my boat and I was about um, 12 miles. I'd done about 12 miles. And, um, you know, I was just really um, hurting. And the people, a whole group of people came to walk with me. It was in the newspapers and people were walking with me. And I sat down. I said, I don't know if I can go any further. 
And this car pulled up and there was this guy in the car and he said, are you the group or with Tracy Martin? And they were like, yeah, here she is. And so I stood up and walked over there and he said, um, um, we, we've been driving for two hours. My wife also has rheumatoid arthritis. She really wanted to meet you. Um, are you she's down at the boat ramp where you're going to finish at, and we'll meet you there. And, and please don't leave until you say hi to her. So I said, okay. And it gave me the motivation and the energy to get up and make it on there. And I spent, I don't know, about 45 minutes sitting and talking with her. And it was that just, um, I will always cherish that. So, That's you know, sometimes, sometimes people say that I encourage them or I motivate them. But when I was paddling the Great Lakes, when people would send me messages, um, I didn't want to let them down. And so they were also motivating me at the same time. I mean, it's yeah, it's super awesome. I mean, just the endeavor in and of itself. Um, and I felt the same way when I was on the Appalachian Trail, just the people that you meet, they they just help you out of like no reason. They have no reason to help you at all. They, they could just let you go on your way, but these people just help. And you're always going to run into a bad apple. You're, you ran into the guy who said he's going to call the police on you. I mean, that's just a thing yeah. that's going to happen, but those amazing relationships and the people you meet is obviously like something you'll never forget. Um, one of the things that I've always, you know, talked to people about who've asked about long distance, you know, uh, what, what do you do in those moments and you know you've been there a million times where you're like, I am so sick of this. I don't want to do it anymore. What do you do to just keep moving on those days where you're like, I'm out, I'm done? Um, so that happened a lot um, towards the end. <laughs> And yeah. basically, I would, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd hurt, and I'd be exhausted, and I was tired, and I was sick of doing it. And, um, and I told myself, I have one more day left in me. You know, maybe I'm just going to paddle for a mile today, but I've got one more day left in me. And I'd get up, and I'd put my dry suit on, and I'd get out there. And usually, once I got out there, and I'd start paddling, I'd obviously do more than a mile. But um, every day I woke up, I would tell myself, Maybe I'll quit tomorrow, but I'm not going to quit today. I've got one more day left in me. And I did that a lot. <laughs> it it wears you down. Like you get tired and your body is mm -hmm. telling you to stop. But in, in these, you know, attempts of these big, big scale things, you have to just tell your brain to shut up sometimes, you know. So yeah. did you um, did you do anything with like, say, listen to music or, or listen to audiobooks while you're out on the water. I mean, electronics don't really bode well with, with the water most of the time, but did they use any of those kind of things to distract you at all? Or did you just like take it all straight to the face, raw, no, no, no music, no nothing? It's interesting you asked me that because when I do my races, I'm listening to high um, energy music and it keeps your cadence high, it keeps you moving. And so um, I really, when I started this, I was listening to the high fast paced music. Um, and then after about a month or two of that paddling every day, it was like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm done with the music. So then I <laughs> audiobooks and I did that for several months and then you know I sort of got tired of that and I stopped listening to anything and I just started to really enjoy the the birds you know there's like hundreds of birds you know because you have the the spring migration you have the fall migration and you there's just birds everywhere and I started to appreciate the sounds of the birds, the sounds of the water, and started to really soak up some of the memories of the landscape and where I was. And um, so the second half, I never used my uh, I never used my electronics to listen to music or to listen to audiobooks. But the first half of the trip, I did. Yeah, it. I feel like that that kind of happened to me too because eventually you just get burned out. You're like, I've listened to everything that I can think of. Yeah. I've listened to all the music. <laughs> I've listened to all the books. It's like, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. And yeah, like nature has a way of just kind of like chilling you out, calming you down. Mm -hmm. And that's why we still go out there and do stuff like this. Is because like for me, that's always the end goal. Yes, I like to push myself a little bit. Yes, I like to you know take on these big things. But at the uh -huh. end of the day, it's like I get to be outside all the time, and that's that's pretty awesome. Um, right. One thing that's different between long distance and just a regular trip is 
the caloric intake you need is just insane. So yeah. how much how much uh, food were you carrying with you versus how much was your kind of crew helping you out when, on days when you're on shore? Because you said earlier you had like an eight day window one time where you were just out there. Yeah. Um, so the type of food that I would carry with me was stuff that I didn't have to cook. So probably uh, it was high carb um, type stuff. I could cram um, like the Sara Lee bagels, a pack mm-hmm. of Sara Lee bagels. I could cram like three of those. I just smash them really, really tight. And I could cram three of those in my hatch. And then I had a little jar of crunchy, um, extra crunchy peanut butter. So, um, you know, sometimes for you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was having bagels with peanut butter. Um, you know, I was, I had, um, protein bars. Um, I had Snickers. I had, um, um, the, the nutritional drinks, sometimes like the Ensure, I would cram like a couple of those into my hatch. I might have one like every other day. Um, and so it was just stuff that I didn't have to cook. And then when I was at the trailer with Bill, then, you know, Bill might cook, um, would have salads at the trailer. Um, he might, you know, would cook like eggs and ham at the trailer. Um, and we cooked like a lot of soup. Um, but, um, we really didn't eat out a lot because I was not only paying for the whole expedition, I was also, you know, paying to, you know, Bill didn't have to pay for anything. So, um, it's really expensive to be eating out. So we really hardly ever ate out. Sometimes we'd pull in somewhere and people would offer to take us out for, um, for a restaurant meal. But for the most, most of the times, you know, we would just stay in the trailer. The trailer had a little refrigerator. Um, we could have cereal, we could have sandwiches. Um, he made a lot of ham and eggs. Um, and uh, oatmeal, he would make a lot of oatmeal. But um, when I was out paddling, you know, the type of stuff that I ate was probably not um, the most nutritious, but it was fast and it was easy. I didn't have to cook it. And that's sort of what I was looking for. Uh, in 2020, when because I was planning on doing it again this year before COVID hit, I did have a stove with me and I did have more nutritional meals with me. I felt like if I had had better nutrition when I was remote camping and out there by myself, that maybe um, I wouldn't have gotten so tired and so sick. I ended up catching pneumonia twice when I was out there in 2017, once in May and again in December. Um, So I, you know, Again, you're you're out there in the cold, you're out there in the weather, you're, you know, a surf ski, you know, doesn't protect you like a sea kayak does, you know, you're wearing your dry suit, but uh, you do get cold. So, you know, I don't know how much of the pneumonia was because uh, you're out in, in the cold every single day or how much of it was just poor nutrition or if it was a combination of the both. But uh, I was planning on having a stove and having better nutrition in 2020. So... So in 2017, uh, it got got it got super cold and stuff started freezing up. So what what was that like when you kind of had to realize that you you weren't going to make it that year? I mean, obviously yeah. it was like an emotional roller coaster. But I've I've watched your YouTube videos on it, and like obviously it sucked. But what was your uh-huh. what was your mindset kind of coming out of that? Like when you decided you were going to do it again, really. Um, well, I mean, I kept holding out hope. Hope is very powerful. And I kept holding out hope that the, um, what my, um, Wendy and my other weather apps was telling me was wrong. And I kept holding out hope that the wind would die down. I kept holding out hope that, cause you know, it was like 18 and 15 degrees out there when I was on the Lake Ontario, um, mm-hmm. and the lake was starting to freeze and I just kept holding out hope. But, um, I think it was December the 15th. Um, it just, it became impossible. I had, I think I had 250 miles left to get the Guinness world record. Um, and um, it just wasn't going to happen. And uh, it was, it was hard. I mean, I cried a lot and I was really depressed and, and then again, hope I, I was like, well, I'll just come back and do it again. But then you get home and you're hit with your financial obligations, you're hit with life, 
And, you know, there is a certain amount of depression that you have to deal with when you've been out paddling or out doing any type of long expedition for any length of time. When you come home, um, there is a certain amount of depression, I guess, you have to deal with. And, um, and then I was really sick. I, um, what had been, I was diagnosed with pneumonia. They gave me um, a treatment of antibiotics. I wasn't any better. They had to do a second treatment of antibiotics to get rid of the pneumonia. Um, and I was really physically beat up. So um, it took almost six months to recover. It was probably summer of 2018 before I actually recovered from paddling in 2017. And um, so, you know, I just told myself, um, I can go back. I mean, I learned so much, you mm-hmm. know, but better nutrition, um, you know, and there was some other things too that I could have done better. And um, as wonderful as people were, people were so wonderful. Um, I would get text messages or, or messenger messages or Facebook messages saying, I live here, come to our house. We want to give you a, a hot meal and a warm bed and a hot shower. So we would we'd pull off the water like at five or six in the evening, load up the boats, drive 30 minutes to this person's house. And then, you know, they would have people that would want to come over and see me and then would be up to like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at mm-hmm. night. And then um, there was no way that we could, you know, I would, and I would say, Hey, you know, we really probably shouldn't have breakfast. We can have breakfast in the trailer. We just need to leave at daylight. Well, we'd get up at daylight and they were in the process of making breakfast and be like, well, this won't be long. And by the time that they've made the breakfast, you sit down, you eat the breakfast. And sometimes other people would come by to have breakfast with us, some of their friends or whatever. Um, we weren't leaving these people's homes till 10 and 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was getting to bed late. I was getting less sleep and I was getting back on the water really late. And if I had all of those times back, I think I would have made it. So, um, 2020, I was going to just let people know, you know, if you want to come down to the water and see us where we're at, that would be fantastic, but we cannot come to your house. You know, I had a trailer, um, it had heat, it had warmth, um, and, um, you know, I really needed to probably um, be a little bit more focused on the goal and, you um, but I was so overwhelmed by all the generosity and I just wanted to make everyone happy. (laughs) So um, I think, you know, not driving 30 minutes to someone's house and having better nutrition would have played a huge role in being more successful. And that's, I, I hear that so much and I feel the same way. Like it's so much harder to just say no than to say yes. It's so hard to say no to people because you don't want to seem rude. But at the same time, you're like, I got stuff I got to do. Like, I'm sorry. And, yeah. and that's it's something that I've tried to learn as well. Like they always say saying no is is a lot more effective than just saying yes to everything. Because then you overcommit and you're like, oh, this sucks. Okay. I don't want to actually be doing this. Uh, so, yeah. So, Obviously, as we all know, on a planetary scale, 2020 was an absolute shit show. So you <laughs> geared up to do this. You what? You, you went out there and started, and then kind of what happened? Well, we started March 1st, and uh, I also decided to change the route up a little bit. I wanted to uh, start in Buffalo instead of Port Huron. Um, and so, and I started. Um, So basically, you know, we were paddling through New York and you were hearing about the virus and people were getting scared about the virus and and restaurants were starting to shut down. And we barely made it out of New York and into PA. And they were like, um, like um, police and and roadblocks. And they were looking at people's driver's license and their and their tags and like, why are you leaving New York and coming into PA? Cause you, cause New York was blowing up and PA mm-hmm. didn't want New Yorkers coming into PA. And so we actually found a local guy and he was able to help us take the back road so we could get from out of New York state into PA. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't really a problem for me cause I was on the water paddling, but it was a problem for um, um, Bill didn't go with me in 2020. Um, in 2017, I met a local guy in Port Port Austin. His name is Marv. 
and there's a lot of pictures of him on my social media, but we're dating now. So Marv is the one driving the, the camper this year. Um, and so Marv is having a horrible time trying to figure out how to get to me. And then um, it was the same thing in PA, trying to get out of PA. And, um, and then in Michigan, you know, we heard that Detroit was blowing up and we heard all these horror stories coming out of Detroit and basically, you know, trying to paddle up the Detroit river. I was, I was going to be in Detroit for several days. And then we heard that Michigan was closing down all their boat ramps and Michigan was closing down their state parks. And actually I paddled into one state park and um, paddled into it. And, you know, I was really comfortable leaving my boat and stuff there and then just coming back. Well, they closed the state park. So then I had to, like, you know, creep <laughs> and go over bar- walk over barricades, you know, go around barricades and walk around barricades to get back to my boat to, to keep on paddling down the shoreline. So um, we made it to um, Cleveland and um, it was just like you know everything oh well the the final decision was when canada closed its borders to americans it was like okay you know we're not going to be able to camp at any of the state parks in michigan we heard that michigan was actually closing down the shoreline um you're weren't you know people weren't even allowed in boats there were um police officers at all the boat ramps making sure people weren't getting onto the lake from the boat ramps and canada closed its borders and we're just like and I told Marv, I said, I had quit my job the last week of February. And I told Marv, I said, if we if if I call my boss, I might be able to get my job back. Um, but if we try, but if we just sit here and wait for this to get better and it gets worse, then you know, we're sort of <laughs> up up a creek here. Yeah. So we we made the decision because I just listening to the news and reading as much as I could read and listen to what people were saying, I had this really bad gut feeling it was going to get a lot worse before it got better. And I wasn't sure that Canada would open its borders back up. So, um, so we made the decision April 1st to stop. And then I came back to Kansas City and got my job back. Uh-huh. It's so Making the decision to do something like this is always hard because like you said, you have to quit your job. Everyone around you is telling you you're a complete idiot because (laughs) you're going to do something that is so crazy and difficult. And, you know, I've been there right there with you. And but like coming home and having to stop doing it is so much harder. And that's like that's such a hard feeling. And like, you know, I'm. Regardless of not completing your own goal, because all these goals are just like our personal psychotic ideas that we come <laughs> up with that nobody's forcing us to do. Like despite not doing that, I I, I personally talk to outdoors people all day long and I'm just completely blown away by what you've accomplished. And I think it's just like to me, it's amazing. I don't physically know if I can do what you're doing. Maybe if I trained a little harder and stopped being such a wimp, I could do that. But that's mind blowing to put in that many that many miles on the Great Lakes, let alone anywhere. If 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 a woman with rheumatoid arthritis can do it, anyone can do it. It's just a matter of mentally do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part. Mental. You can you can you can row your arms off and your back off, but if your mind's not in it, you're never gonna get it done. Um, so I, I I assume you're not the kind of person that just gives up after a few obstacles. So what's the plan moving forward? Um, well, um, basically, I came home and I had to decide what else did I want to do? You know, I, I attempted the Great Lakes twice, failed, you know, COVID hit. Um, so there's so many other things I want to do besides just paddling the Great Lakes. There's Channel Islands National Park off the coast of California. I've been told they're just amazing and beautiful. You could spend a month, you could take a month off and go out there and paddle and camp and hike out there. Um, You know, there's the Inside Passage, there's the Yukon River. I've paddled most of the lower Missouri down to St. Louis, but I've never paddled any of the upper Missouri. I would love to paddle the upper Missouri. Um, There's also a Guinness World Record for the fastest descent um, of the Mississippi River by a solo female. And I would sort of like to try that. 
So, um, you know, I basically sat down and recreated a new bucket list of things that I really want to do. Um, before I left in 2020 in February, I actually had sold my house to pay for all of this. Um, and so, um, I'm currently living in my daughter's basement. Um, but, um, I basically just decided that, you know, there's other things that I want to do. So for 2021, I think I might attempt the, um, the Guinness World Record for the Mississippi River uh, because it's inside the United States. And um, I think that that would be something that I can do. You know, we've got the vaccine now and I've already gotten my first dose of the vaccine, actually. And um, I should be getting my second dose here. I think it's 20 days or something. And, um, and then once you've got your two doses, you're supposedly immune. Mm-hmm. So um, I think I'm going to attempt the, the Guinness World Record of the Mississippi for the fastest female solo descent. And then in 2022, Marvin and I have talked about trying to go back and do the Great Lakes again, uh, as long as Canada has opened up the border. Um, and then, um, you know, we've talked about paddling the Inside Passage and the Yukon River together. Uh the Great Lakes I do solo with him as my support driver. And we've talked about going, driving out to California and paddling Channel Islands. So basically right now I've got two jobs and I'm working as much as I can and saving as much as I can. And then um, we just plan on doing the stuff that we want to do while we're still both physically able to do it. Because eventually the RA is going to make it so I can't paddle anymore. Um, You know, I used to do triathlons. I used to run. And I can't run anymore. I love to hike and backpack. And I can still go on little day hikes, but I can't backpack anymore. Um, And I I know eventually I'm not going to be able to do these long, year-long expeditions. But I want to keep going for as long as I can. So that's sort of the plan. And I think it's important to try to do the Mississippi River attempt this year. because, you know, every year it, it gets harder for me with the rheumatoid arthritis. And this is a race uh, for the fastest time. So to be successful, I probably need to try to do it sooner than later. So I don't know. Just things. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's also awesome. I mean, no matter what you do, it's just like the, the joy of getting out there and pushing yourself is mm-hmm. just one of the best things on earth, even if it sucks and it's miserable, like it's still amazing. Everything you've done is amazing. And I'm, I'm really, I'm stoked to watch you do these other challenges that you're putting yourself through because kind of like living vicariously through people right now (laughs) doing this stuff. And, and I'm just super stoked to be able to talk to you and and thank you for sharing your story uh, on the podcast. And before we kind of sign off here, maybe let people know where to find you, your website and social media and stuff so they can keep in touch and follow your upcoming journeys. Um, Well, my website is called Just Around the Point and points, P-O-I-N-T-E. So justaroundthepoint.com. I have a a Facebook group, which is also Just Around the Point. You just have to type that into Facebook. Um, And um, I did have a, I have a Twitter account, but I haven't been doing that so much. So mostly Facebook right now is what I've been doing mostly. Um, And then I've been working um, on just updating the, the website but yeah so um um i love hearing from people and i love hearing people's stories and it just you know it really motivates me when people reach out to me with their stories so that's always totally welcomed well on that upcoming uh, attempt of the great lakes again uh-huh. I'm going to follow it. And if you're going to be able to come through Toledo, I'll maybe I'll be able to pop in and take some pictures or something for you because <laughs> I'm literally be a few miles away from the river. So, all right. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm very, very uh, excited that you came on and shared your story with me because I've been like giggling like a little schoolboy over <laughs> here about this for like a week or two now since we started talking. So uh, thank you very much. And reach out at any time. If you uh, do any more trips, I'll gladly have you back on. 
That would be great. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of the Aptitude Outdoors podcast here on YouTube. If you can, give me a hand. Go down below and hit that subscribe button. Also, if you're feeling a little frisky, head over to iTunes or Stitcher and leave the podcast a rating or review. I want to take a minute to thank Tracy Lynn Martin for coming on and sharing all of her awesome knowledge and stories about through paddling. And I hope that she has some awesome trips planned for this year because I know last year was a little bit of a mess for all of us. So thank you, Tracy, for coming on and thank you all for watching. Can't wait to see you again next time.